So last Sunday, I, uh, I gave you all the heads up that we're going to be doing this sort of three-week jaunt through parts of the letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in Rome. Congregations that he didn't plant in a city he had never visited. This makes it quite unique among the seven letters that scholars have ascribed to his authorship. It's also the longest of Paul's missives, and thus appears first among the epistles of the New Testament, even though it was likely the last of his surviving letters that we have, being crafted in the end stage of his life and career. The dominant view of biblical scholarship is that this letter functioned for Paul as a sort of cover letter for who he was and what he believed. Spelled out clearly, though not concisely, for his potential hosts in Rome. The letter is sort of like a self-report. This is who I am, and this is the gospel I proclaim. Hopefully, dispelling rumors about him and reassuring the churches in Rome that Paul does indeed come in peace. So unlike the letters to the Thessalonians or even the church in Galatia, the Paul we hear in the lines of Romans is a more measured, a more thoughtful, reflective apostle. He is intentional about what he is writing to these congregations that he had never met. He is less reactionary and more pastoral, even theological. He wants his readers to know what he's about before he shows up on their doorstep. Also important for our consideration of the letter to the Romans is its impact on Christianity for the past two millennia. We cannot overstate this. No book of the New Testament has proven to be more influential in the history of Christian thought and theology than the letter to the Romans. It is one of the most frequently quoted pieces of Christian literature during the early centuries of the church, for example. At the end of the fourth century, it was instrumental in Augustine's conversion, a man whose own writings, based in large measure on his understanding of Romans, shaped the thinking of theologians throughout the Middle Ages. Romans also stood at the center of debates between Protestants and Catholics during the 16th century Reformation, when Protestant leaders such as Martin Luther and John Calvin saw it as the clearest exposition of Christian doctrine in the writings of the apostles. Romans was formative to Luther and also later to John Wesley uh, and the Methodist movement. Uh, it was central to their understanding of justification by faith. And then in the 21st century, Romans continues to be one of, if not the most influential book in contemporary Christian circles. So we need to state that this is a heavy hitter. Now, speaking of justification by faith, while I'm not going to spend the bulk of my time on this today, it bears repeating because it's an important distinction. And it's not one that gets airtime in most worship settings or even educational settings outside of seminary. And that is the distinction between justification and sanctification. Oh, she's doing a teaching sermon today. Oh, and there's going to be some Greek later too, baby. Justification and sanctification are concepts touted largely by this letter. And it becomes part of our Christianese, although I suspect most people don't know how to define either term. If you've been around Knox for a while... Uh, I still think, and you've heard me preach on this before, I still think we can do with a refresher. So jot this down. Justification is a once and done event. To be justified, it's a legal term, is to be acquitted. It is the declaration that a person is made right with God. And here's the part that we often mistake. And it's because our English translations of the scriptures are problematic. So David, you cannot be held responsible for this uh, in your interpretation at the start of the scripture reading because it's our translations, our scriptures that have it wrong. We have wrongly read justif justification by faith as meaning that we are justified by our faith. 
but that is incorrect. We are justified through Christ's faithfulness. I invite you to scoop back to verse uh, 22 in chapter 3 of Romans. And you'll read there the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all. Okay, Will actually picked up a Bible, so he gets a bonus point today. Uh, You're all welcome to do that. There are Bibles in the pews. Uh, Like, check me. Don't just assume. Okay, but not all at once. That's what Wednesday's for. If we scoot back to 322, you'll read the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is incorrect. The Greek preposition here is not the word in, it is the word of. It is not in, it is the word of, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Jesus was so faithful, so obedient to the outpouring of the kingdom of God, so unflinchingly dedicated to God's message, to the good news of welcome and grace, compassion, justice, and forgiveness, that that message would eventually get him crucified. And he was willing to do it and be faithful to this nonviolent mission to the point that he would suffer and die. It is not our faith in Jesus that does that, that guarantees salvation. It is his faithfulness to God's mission of redemption for all to the point that he was willing to be shamed, tortured, beaten, punished, and killed. Not by, oh, pay attention, not by God who needed him to die, but a world that couldn't let him live. I'll say that again. It is in Christ's faithfulness to God's mission of redemption for all, to the point that he was willing to be shamed, tortured, beaten, punished, and killed, not by God who needed him to die, but by a world that could not let him live. His faithfulness was to God, and it is that faithfulness that Paul is talking about. It is by Jesus' faith that we are saved, not our own. Our own would never suffice it would be an impossible task. So we latch on to the faithfulness, the obedience, the dedication that Jesus demonstrated in his life and death, and we let that guide how we live our own lives, seeking to let that same faithfulness, obedience, and dedication shape our lives. And the word for that process is sanctification. It's being formed again and again into the likeness of Jesus every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a moment-by-moment transformation. When we pray our prayer asking for forgiveness and receiving the assurance of forgiveness, we are doing that work. We're participating in sanctification. Help me to do better today. Justification, once and done, by the faith of Jesus. Sanctification, a daily transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit as we cling to Christ and seek to align our lives again and again with his own. This is how you know we're in Romans. Here's the rub with striving to be like Christ. You see, Christ's unwavering loyalty to the kingdom of God led him to suffering and ultimately to death, death on the cross. If we actually seek to follow him, shouldn't we assume that our fate ought to be similar? And here's where I think modern Christianity gets it wrong. We somehow, along the way, got the idea that loyalty to Jesus and salvation through the faith of Jesus, if we're reading the Greek right, would mean receiving a pass, a spiritual equivalent of those get-out-of-jail-free cards you get in Monopoly, right? Some kind of spiritual equivalent of get-out-of-suffering-free. So that when cancer came knocking at our door, or when a child threatened to break our heart, uh, when it looked like we might lose a beloved job, we could whip out one of those cards and say, sorry, I follow Jesus, so I refuse delivery on this package of grief. 
It does not work that way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And so knowing that, maybe we're clever enough to realize that no, suffering is part of this discipleship gig. Uh, So what we do instead is we manufacture our own suffering or persecution for the sake of the gospel. We try to control it. A suffering we can manufacture is suffering we can actually tolerate. Uh, We're not truly inconvenienced by it too much because we have created it. In the rise of this trend, recent scholarship has coined the term Christian persecution complex. And we know it. Do you know when we hear it? At Christmas time, when the plain red cups come out at Starbucks and we all get incensed. When we're greeted with happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. Ouch. When we get real frazzled about secularism in the public schools. Mm. Or about welcoming LGBTQ plus people and immigrants. Or women having the right to choose what to do with their own bodies. We are being persecuted, we say. We are suffering for the gospel in this immoral hellscape for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus. Um, I wrote to myself, good grief, I roll. So I'd like you to imagine seeing me eye roll. This is what Paul says. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, whose faith? Jesus, okay. We are justified by faith, whose faith? Thank you, not mine, not yours. We cannot do that. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God, and not only that, Paul writes, but we also boast in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And so it would probably help to hold the word here translated suffering under some light, lest we become part of the Christian persecution complex. The Greek word philipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, is sometimes translated suffering, but also persecution, affliction, and tribulation. What's not immediately evident in that translation is that this is referring to an internal suffering. That is, it carries the challenge of coping with the internal pressures of a stressor, especially when we feel there's no way of escape. Compare this then, oh, you're getting another Greek word, uh, to stenoxoria, you're welcome which focuses on the external pressure exerted by circumstances. So for example, places where it is illegal to practice your faith, where being a Christian can very much be life-threatening if discovered by law enforcement. That is suffering. External circumstances that cause internal suffering, enduring that kind of suffering, certainly produces character and hope. But what of us? What of Christians, what of Christians rather, who are able to practice freely and whose greatest collective complaint is that shopping is available on Sundays and it's not illegal to marry someone that you love regardless of sex or gender. Rather than an internal suffering, it's more like a mild inconvenience for the sake of the gospel. It has no real bearing on my quality of life or my ability to worship God and practice my discipleship. And so we might be more authentic in changing this word in verse 3 to problems. We have more problems than we have suffering for Christ because we're also survivors and we're enduring. We live in the most affluent community in Canada, with access to supports and good infrastructure. So, where does choosing to follow Jesus actually cause us any real suffering? Suffering that produces endurance. 
What if those of us who are not victims, here's your million dollar question for today. What if those, who are, those of us who are not victims of external suffering are called to choose suffering that encourages endurance for others? What if we can choose to suffer so that others can endure, can do more than just survive, so that they can thrive? For example, suffering might mean doing without so that others can have. It was John the Baptist who talked about if you have two coats, you ought to give one away. You only need the one. It can mean paying more for clothes so that workers in factories in developing countries can be safe, or better yet, learning which brands use modern enslaved labor to produce their products, and avoiding purchasing from them. I've told you before, and I'll say it again, look into the factory and delivery practices at Amazon. It's disgusting. I'll choose to pay more and wait longer for a purchase if it means keeping a cent of my support out of that monstrous company. Suffering, the internal struggle that comes with choosing the way of the kingdom over the way of the world, might mean paying more for food that is grown locally, grown and gathered humanely, and for sure sustainably, and then, don't just stop there, doing the work of justice to fight grocery store profiteering during an economic crisis. This life of faith thing is meant to have very real, very tangible impact on our day-to-day -day lives and our interactions. And it should make a difference in other people's lives too. Following Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, that should make the world better for the people around you, whether or not they follow Jesus. Blessed to be a blessing, a conduit of justice and hope and mercy and grace and compassion. Suffering that makes endurance possible for someone else. It cannot be a Sunday morning thing. Just leaving it on a Sunday doesn't produce endurance or character or hope for ourselves or anyone else. That's tokenism. Choosing the more difficult way for the sake of the kingdom might mean using public transportation or carpooling to relieve congestion and pollution. I don't know, these are little things, right? Really, little things. Suffering means leaving apathy and ignorance behind. Learning, growing, doing better, choosing solidarity with others in their pain. Suffering is acknowledging white privilege and actively working to dismantle it. I could keep going because this is the actual gospel. I invite you to look at the life of Jesus himself. In what ways did he choose a better way of justice, grace, love, and compassion? In what ways did his faithfulness to this way lead to his arrest, shame, punishment, and death. Jesus was not crucified for being a nice guy. He was not persecuted for being gentle Jesus, meek and mild. There was something disruptive about his presence in the world. There's something disruptive about the presence of his disciples in the world. Enough that the empire wanted to shame and snuff them out. Does the empire say the same about us? Are we just good citizens? Faithfulness that leads to suffering. Can we consider that? And can we choose to do likewise? And so you're invited, as am I, to look at your own life this week and consider, are there ways to make more Christ-like choices? Are there ways to get educated? 
to resist ignorance and apathy? Will it produce suffering? More importantly, will it help others to endure? Because it's this endurance that produces character and character that produces hope. And hope through Christ is everlasting. Thanks be to God. Amen.